Well, thanks for agreeing to talk to us. Hey, no problem. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I've put up quite a detailed blog post. Uh, I don't know if you've managed to have a chance to have a look at it yet, but basically um, it's talking about you from the point of view, which I suppose we've never really had that conversation. It's more about how I view you as being that kind of conflict reporter. Um, so, you know, not necessarily a okay. war reporter or a war correspondent, all those things that you've been called over that over the time, um, you know, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker. But that really conflict from a conflict reportage point of view, reporting on conflict, it's something that you've got an incredible amount of experience about. Um, and maybe you treat it seriously or you don't or you talk about it or you don't or it's just something that you've done and it's an experience. Um, all of those things shape you. I think, and uh, and we've never really spoke about the role that maybe your faith plays as well in you know the way that you approach your filmmaking or how you now work in that kind of humanitarian sector with um, uh, people like you know the, the film that you're making in Mali um, or your interest in arts and a monsoon, um, and also it, it, it's been quite interesting to do the research on you as well and see some of the stuff that you did. Um, for the BBC as well with Iraq, um, so as a as a video as a video producer there um, with the sort of you know one day in war, which as again is a project I was unaware of as well. Because it was quite interesting. So during all of that time, I just wondered really wh where your motivation came from and has it changed over the years as you as you've done all of these different things? Huh. Wow, that's a very that's a loaded question. Um, my motivation probably, you know, John, when I was a kid, I just was interested in war movies and war films and this idea of the hero and things like this. So I gravitated toward sort of conflict studies and ended up getting my education in conflict studies. My undergraduate in the United States and my postgraduate at King's London there uh, across uh, from White City, the, the not across from White City, but uh, uh, across the Strand from, I think, the old BBC radio location. That's right. Yeah. The old location. Bush House. Um, yeah. Bush Town, that's right. And... Um, it was interesting. I, I didn't really know what to do with that, but a friend of mine kind of challenged me, and he says, "Well, you spent all this time and money studying war. What, what the heck, you know?" And I said, "Yeah, you're right." And um, there was a little-known war going on in the Republic of Georgia at a place called Abkhazia, and it kind of this friend's challenge just kind of got me thinking I should probably go to one and mm. see what it was all what it was all about. And so. Um, through a, I won't go through the long story, but ventured over to the Republic of Georgia, made my way to Abkhazia. A lot of Georgia was unsettled at that time. There was issues in Azhar, this was in Ingrelia. I know these names don't mean anything to most viewers, but it just wasn't like one little spot. Georgia was mm. a country in chaos, like most former Soviet republics in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War. And I kind of grew up as a Cold War bit child, so I, you know, there was always the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union. Now, all of a sudden, there's all these sort of what they also referred to at the time as as brush fire wars mm. around the Soviet periphery. Mm. So I went to Georgia, and it was the beginning of me, it was something I, that I really enjoyed doing, and part of it was the investigative journalism part, mm. like uncovering the facts about just what was going on. Um, and then also just, there was an adventure aspect to it, I, I won't lie. It was uh, great fun to be out there in the early 90s, mm -hmm. kind of living on that edge, or like, you know, the Wild West, you know, uh, to use an American you know metaphor. But, um, and so I didn't really, I, didn't, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I do like the idea of making documentary film, but I didn't really know anything about it. So I went and bought a little Sony high eight millimeter camera, which is not all I could afford. It fit in my backpack. Mm -hmm. But I also sort of made my first marks by writing mm -hmm. because I would write up, you know, things. And so uh, having gone to school in London, the Department of War Studies connected me to uh, people at Jane's, mm -hmm. Jane's Defense, Jane's uh, Pub Defense Publishing. And so I ended up writing my first piece first pieces for James Intelligence Review during my graduate study work. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and that, that kind of, I wouldn't, yeah, maybe it's fair to say it launched me. Mm. I mean, it was cool. Now, the, the bad part was you can't make a living as a freelance writer for James. <laughs> you have to be a freelance writer for a lot of different publications, mm. at least for the field that I was interested in, in, like, conflict and things like that. I mean, it's not like it was Vanity Fair where you're, you know, you can have, you know, you can write one piece of, if you're lucky enough to write for someone like Vanity Fair. Uh, but, um, you know, so I just kind of looked around. I still had an interest in film. And I came back and I went to work for a company out of New York City that had made the early Firepower series, the early Wing series for the Discovery Channel way back in the day, like, you know, mid-early 90s. And it was really where I cut my teeth on learning how to be an editor, 
learning how to tell a story, working with other people, going to interviews. And so I thought, man, my ideal world would be able to sort of fuse the two things together, like filmmaking, but also the writing and the analysis part. Um, and that's kind of what I've tried to do with, you know, sometimes more success than others in the, in the last 25, 30 years. Yeah. And how, did, so, and how did you find yourself in Afghanistan? Um, embedded for that first uh, that first sort of major incursion of the U.S. forces. You know that was um, an interesting. So in 1997, I was making my way to Chechnya to do a story in Chechnya, which was going to turn out to be my very first uh, independent documentary. Uh, just as a side note, looking back on it, it's not a very good film. It's actually, I'm, it's really hard for me to watch. It's my first film. <laughs> I, I like I like to love, tell people I did it, but at the same time I'm like I don't really know if I want anybody to watch it. Yeah. You know. Um, but anyway, in '97, it's a long story again that I won't get into. But I ended up in Uzbekistan, and I shouldn't have been in Uzbekistan. But anyway, I was there. I went down by the border to Termez area, and the Afghans at that time in '97 they were in the process. There were some shells falling across the river into Uzbekistan proper. General Dostum, the Uzbek. Afghan leader of, 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 of Uzbek um, ethnicity was in and out of the, of the Uzbek area. And I kind of was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. But, you know, we didn't do anything, but we went on to, you know, get into Chechnya through a different, you know, through a different way, which we weren't going to go through Uzbekistan anyway. Like I said, it's a really ridiculous story. But um, when 9 11 occurred, uh, it was kind of one of those things we were doing a few different film projects or a few different projects, but it was almost like, you know, it was the first time since I started my career that America was at war, mm. basic, in a major way. I'm not, you know, look, covert operations, I, I, I'm not counting those. But um, so I knew we had to go. The big decision for me was a lot of the journalists and people that wanted to cover the war were covering from the Pakistan side, and some were coming through Tajikistan. For me, I knew for, I just knew who I was going to go through Uzbekistan because that's where my familiarity was. Mm-hmm. So I, I flew to Tashkent, excuse me, and made my way down to Termez. And after a really frustrating six weeks, was able to cross the border and stumble, more or less, literally, just stumble into the Kalajungi Fortress Uprising, where, you know, about five or six hundred non-Afghan fighters, Taliban, non-Afghan foreigners in the Taliban ranks had been taken kind of prisoner, revolted, killed all of Dostum's guys. And then, lo and behold, after the melee, a few days later, we discovered the American Taliban, John Walker Lind. And that became a huge story, of course, in America. The story itself was big because that was our first combat KIA also. Mm. Johnny Michael Spann, CIA, um, former Marine Corps officer, a CIA analyst. Um, I wasn't an analyst, he was a field op. Uh, was killed in that battle on day one. Mm. And so there was a lot of... The, it was important to America. Well, Afghanistan was really important to the United States immediately following 9-11. So mm. that's kind of how I ended up to be there. Parts of it were purely by chance. Other parts were familiarity with Uzbekistan and feeling like, why try Pakistan? Why go to Tajikistan? I know, I know Uzbekistan. So I've often thought about that 1997 trip, you know, just wondered how fortuitous it really was because it kind of set me up to go there back in 2001. And I'm really glad I went that way because this is the funny thing. I was, I was stringing for CBS at the time and they weren't, I don't think they were convinced I could do anything. They didn't really have a lot of camera experience, but they gave me a satellite phone, some travel money. First time in my life I ever had anything up front. Yeah. So I was like, this is awesome. I've got a phone. I've got $5,000, which, you know, $5,000, how long does it last? But hey, man, it's better than nothing. And when I stumbled onto this fight, you know, I just start to turn my camera and start shooting. And it was remarkable because there had really been no journalistic access. We just It was just purely luck for me and all the other people documenting to just stumble into Mazar Sharif that week when the College Junkie Fortress Uprising went down. <clears throat> because, and then by the time we started reporting, I reported for um, for CBS that night, and um, shoot, two days later, man, there was twice as many, maybe three times as many journalists, filmmakers, reporters mm. who had descended on the fortress because it was actually we were sending back me, me and some of the other reporters. What I was told were the first combat images of the war, mm. um, and so it was it was fascinating to be there then, and pure, in luck and purely lucky because mm. I had gone through Tajikistan and past, you know. Um, Pakistan, I wouldn't have wouldn't have been there. I would have been someplace else. But everything really focused on the north right then, and that was the other reason. You know, we seemed to roll up the Taliban in earlier places, but we were looking to take Mazar and Kunduz, those two big northern cities. 
So it also <laughs> seemed like, in a way, it held us up from getting into Afghanistan because the fight was still on for those northern provinces. But once it, we were able to get in, we were kind of had a front row seat to hmm. the collapse of the Taliban armies in the north. Hmm. So again, it's timing, really, I guess, isn't it? It's been in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually covering, covering combat, it's all about being in the right place at the right mm-hmm. time. War, uh, and I learned this in I call it Jungi, it's just, it's, it's really, um, it's certainly random. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting because we were fighting a big fortress, which wasn't that big, a few hundred football fields or pitch, you know, pitches, you know, up square. But if you were on, uh, for instance, I didn't even know there was a Dishka, you know, heavy machine gun in the parapet just across from me, like 150 yards, because there was so much chaos and confusion on the parapet I was at. It wasn't until, you know, talking to special forces operators, and they actually showed me some pictures. I'm like, where's that Dishka? They go, oh, it was over on the other corner. I'm like, you can hear Dishka for miles. Mm. I couldn't hear it from 150 yards. Mm. I had no idea there was any fight going on from that side of the corner. Mm. So it was really kind of a lesson in, which is reinforced when I was in Iraq a few years later, when you're in the, in the urban centers, like you could be fighting on one corner and then the, across the block getting a Coke. I mean, it was just weird, you know. This, it wasn't like a whole battlefield. It was just, you know, the battlefield is up in sections. So that sort of ta- tactical fighting in <clears throat> the tactical environment was really interesting. Mm. How, does, how does your approach change as, as, as a camera operator with each conflict that you cover? change what do you, in what sense i mean do, do, do you do you find that the way that you operate changes your, yourself do you become more aware less aware do you become immune do you become hypersensitive you know you're, you're, the difference between what you did in afghanistan and what you did in some of the former soviet republics and then iraq is there is there a commonality and a, a similarity between it all but some of them you just turn around and go that place just felt more dangerous or yeah. I never really felt in danger there, even though it was, seemed more chaotic. I never felt in danger. Right. Oh, actually, that's a really good question. Um, because I have strong answers and strong feelings for this. I mean, hands down now, for me, the worst place I ever was that I felt was Chechnya. And I wasn't actually there during the war. I was there during the interwar period. But even during the interwar period, the Arabs, I was in the east part with Shamil Basayev's guys, the Arabs went across the Dagestan, attacked a Russian tank park. The Russians chased him back with attack helicopters and artillery fire stuff. One of the warlords, Salman Raduyev, was upset at President Muscatov, so he led his BMPs and tanks down the main street in, in Grozny. So even this is the peaceful period, it wasn't peaceful. Yeah. And the Chechens I was with, um, it's an honor-based society, and I, I know that frustrates some of the Russians and stuff. I'm not meaning that it's honor like it's better than theirs. It's just an honor-based sort of tribal society. ID and I'm, I'm simplifying so the Chechen file, Chechen file, they're all going to get out of my case as well. Mm. But once they kind of agree to take care of you or take you in or let you there, they protect you. So they were very, very cautious. We moved every day. I think I slept in a different place every single night. Mm. I don't think I spent two nights in a row because they were afraid that if we were found out or a pattern or you know was 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 this, um, revealed that we might be killed or kidnapped or taken hostage because that was a big deal in Chechnya at that time. So it just felt dangerous. I mean, we slept with our clothes on, and then I remember we had these big beds, and I'd sleep in the middle. I had a camera guy with me. I was able to convince to go, and my two bodyguards were on the outsides. PK machine guns down on the floor, all of our boots at the, at the, at the base of the bed, and if we were to come under attack, it was just assumed we'd just throw in our boots. They'd grab the, machine, they'd grab the PKs, and out the door we'd go blaze until we can get in our vehicle and escape or who knows what Mm. when it came to afghanistan especially in the early part it was kind of nice i I mean i was independent i traveled independent but i i I met immediately we met well because the cia member had been killed we met cia elements coming into theater uh there were some special forces teams there but for me there was a sort of a calmness it was the first place i'd been where there was other americans Mm. and then of course when I got to Iraq, and I was part of that official embed, where they you know, embedded over 700 journalists and filmmakers, writers, you were with a unit from your country. So even though Iraq may have been technically more dangerous in a certain time and period, there was a comfort zone there because you were with mm. your, your troops. So it didn't mean there wasn't 
friction and there was all this there's still been lots of debates about did we tell accurate stories because of the embed hmm. where we you know psychologically preconditioned to say good things about us fighting forces because you build up friendship you know i get all, all that hmm. but it didn't ever feel as bad afghanistan and iraq never felt as bad not the times that i was there it doesn't mean that they weren't i mean they were horrible places at hmm. that time the only time i really felt not concerned, but dismay and just really felt disheartened a little bit was when we got into the urban areas. And, you know, I've seen it over and over and over again where civilians, you think they know, hey, man, there's 30 tanks and, you know, 600 Marines just rolled in. But yet they drive kind of across the highway close to you or whatever, a jumpy Marine, you know, or, or you know, guns them down because he doesn't know. You know, there's, there's words of... Uh, uh, v beds, uh, vehicle board IEDs, suicide bombers approaching vehicle, you know, approaching U.S. forces and British forces in, you know, bomb laden cars. So you don't ever let a vehicle approach your perimeter. And as a result, you know, we killed a fair amount of civilians. And that was disheartening to see a car full of a family like wiped out in a car. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was tough. That was tough on me. Mm -hmm. It still is, you know, um, a little different than combatants fighting on the battlefield like a call a junkie mm. where it was, there were no most peacefuls there was no civilians mm. there was no collateral damage they were taliban mm. and they were fighting and there was dosum's forces that flooded back in to counter the fight and the escape and it was very clear cut and uh even though there was sadness and we saw death there it just felt different than seeing mm. civilians killed mm. and you know it wasn't just gunning down cars you know it was like precision guided munitions i think are Obviously fantastic, but shrapnel still flies a long way. A round from a 50 caliber still goes through two or three houses. So you could be out of the sort of battle zone and kill somebody three blocks over. Happened all the time in Iraq because the, the conditions, the fighting conditions, that's just where, that's just what they were. were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a little tougher, which is, you know, we know that militaries around the world always practice for like urban war fighting, mm -hmm. urban tactics, things like that. But of which the Chechens, of course, you know, were like the, poster children for urban contact fighting they were mm, mm. everybody was studying what they did just because mm. i think people were so shocked how quickly they decimated the initial russian forces that went into chechnya new year's eve 1994 now throughout this whole period of time when you're acting as a sort of camera operator in bed that kind of stuff are you still are you still writing <clears throat> i know you'd written a, i know you'd written um a couple of books and stuff like that but were you still Stringing for other people, were you still doing your investigative journalism as much as you could? Well, because I lucked out and was able to capture Kala Jungi as a stringer for CBS, you know, and that was again, I had that sat phone, which broke in about two weeks. The one thing I learned is a man, equipment just uh, battlefield conditions are harsh on equipment. Um, Iraq was a great example. I, I took two uh, DV cam cameras in my backpack. I think I, I did leave with one that still worked, one didn't. Um, I had a sat phone that, that until the command asked journalists or basically told journalists they couldn't use their sat phones, um, was worked some of the time. Hmm. In the group that I was with, there was a Washington Post reporter who was close by, and he had a functioning, you know, pop-up sat phone. I had an Iridium or, you know, like, so I couldn't, it was hard... He was the only one that could, could, on a regular basis, seem to get a story out. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted anything out, which I tried a couple times, I think I got a couple things out. I had to do it via the Washington Post reporter's, you yeah. know, sat phone. Mm -hmm. um, it, was just, it was just simply logistically hard. I know it's easier now, but again, and that's one thing I try to tell. So we speak to a lot of young filmmakers or, you know, different universities. We'll talk, talk to students. And now that I think the assumption is everything just works online, and, you know, <laughs> 2002, 2003. I mean, yeah, we had online, we had internet, but man, it wasn't easy. Hmm. And broadband speeds weren't anything like they were today. Hmm. And it was hard. Hmm. It was hard to just get your material out. So what hmm. you had to do, in fact, when I was, I was stringing for CBS during the Iraq war as well. And I think I was only able to find, we crisscrossed the CBS crew that actually had a link that could upload footage. I had been, you know, two weeks, I never saw another Mm. news crew so i just had stacks of tape that i couldn't do anything mm. with it mm. i couldn't couldn't get it the only yeah there's just no way i mean i could have there were some reporters i know that left their units 
they'd see another unit off in the desert horizon, which I thought was always really bizarre. And they just walked to the other unit, which I meant that's risky, you know, not being unidentified, walking on someone's like three or nine position, you know, Hey, I'm the, you know, I'm with the times or something, you know, <laughs> but it was hard to get your material out. A lot of, I know some print reporters were calling in their stories, I think actually dictating stories, mm-hmm. but it was for a vi- uh, visual, you know, for my thing, you need more visual, really hard to yeah. get those images out. Yeah. But we did make a film for Channel 4, so everything we were shooting, we ended up bringing back and putting together And before the summer of 2003, just a few months after the initial invasion period, we produced that film, Virgin Soldiers, for mm. Channel 4. Mm. Mm. Is that, that and is that the one that you won the award for as well? No. no we won the Rory Peck and Roy, Roy, uh, Royal Television Awards for House of War, right, the, okay. the college young. Yeah. And then we were, we actually were nominated the, the next year for Virgin Soldiers, but we mm. did not win. We were mm. just one of the finalists. Mm. Okay. So uh, during this period of time when you're covering these various conflicts, is there uh, a moment you can specifically remember where you turned around and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to change the kind of filmmaking that I do. No, never, never. Okay. Well, certainly not out there. There was nothing I saw or participated in or, um, that caused me to say that then. Mm. I, frankly, I just, you get old. And yep. Being in combat is yeah. hard. Mm. It's exhausting. And so as time goes on, mm. and I have a family, um, it's a little more, more interesting to me to do projects that are still global in nature, because mm. that's we really like that kind of stuff. And, that, and that's reflected in the films we did for the Smithsonian, you know, Arts of the Monsoon, that just tracks the exchange of culture and art along the East Indian Sea, uh, East Africa seaboard with the state of Oman. Hmm. Um, no active conflicts there. A little tension in Zanzibar, a little Islamic tension. There's issues in, you know, there, but, um, and then, and then we just did one in, uh, uh, looking at Brazil's borders, which we, uh, just announced last week will be distributed through journeyman, journeyman TV, journeyman pictures. And, um, you know, the Amazon is, is a hectic place and there's all kinds of trafficking and we were with Brazilian military. And so I guess there is an element of danger there, but it wasn't like the active combat mm. things mm. that I did. I'm not necessarily opposed to doing those. Mm. It's just, um, it's hard on, it's hard on your body. Yeah. Hey man, I'm at the age that the guys in my contemporaries in the army are colonels and generals, so yeah. they're not out in the tank. Um, or the, you know, the BMP or not BMP, but what do we call APC. Yeah. Not out, but, uh, on, the, not out on the ground. Yeah. I was out there. Yeah, not out on the ground yeah. anymore, like back in the command center. Yeah. No. But, but I do remember guys like General Mattis, man, he was great. I mean, I think that's one reason why he's so revered in the Marine Corps. Hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, he was on a helicopter because he had to cover the entire first Marine, you know, the first meth footprint. But he'd land in our position, get out, talk to everybody, talk to soldiers, fight it. You know, he just, was, he was there, man. He's just one of the guys. And, I mean, we had to go out and see another battalion or whatever, an organizer, another, but boy, that guy, I don't know if he slept for three weeks. I'm sure he did, but mm. he was always there. Yeah. So. Now, you, now, you mentioned arts of the monsoon and that kind of your interest in art as well. And I'm quite, I was fascinated to look at your Facebook page that you've got around the, the red paint uh, and this collection, oh, yeah. this collection you've got of artwork that's all related from sort of Russia, China, stuff like that. How did you first become interested in that? Well, actually, that's an interesting story because that's how I first got to Republic of Georgia to look at the war in Abkhazia. So um, I was living in Salt Lake City. And um, actually, that's not true. I wasn't living in Salt Lake City, but I was in Salt Lake City visiting some friends. I live in here. I live here now. So that's why I couldn't remember for a second. But um, they were collecting social realism art from an artist who lived in Ajara in a place called Batumi. He was a Ukrainian artist. I've always kind of liked strong sort of Soviet art, especially like their military political art themes. I'm not mm. necessarily a poster junkie, but I really like the themes that was portrayed in them. Mm. And so uh, I, the, the person who was the expert in the art said, well, I want to go and get this art for these investors, but Georgia's just, it's tough in Georgia. You know, I'm not going there, Bob. I can't do it. It's just like too much for me. So I said, I'll go. And they're like, why would you go? I go, well, there's a war two wars going on there. I'd love to, I'd love to go to Georgia. So it ended up that I carried the cash. I had $35,000 stuffed in my pockets and my socks um, <laughs> and the bag. Cause it was a dollar. It was a cash only economy. You know, the ruble was in hyperinflation. It was 19, yeah, 93. And, um, we went over there and we bought art 
and it was an education in itself, and it was really fun, and I was able to secure a few pieces for myself. In fact, that one right there on the wall behind me, that was like the first piece I ever bought. It's probably the best piece I own, but I it's I bought it out in Batumi. Hmm. It's a Yakovenko painting. It's called October Days, and it depicts the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, but I was kind of hooked, and so I kept my eye out. Uh, I was in and out of Ukraine on another project, uh, in fact, on about music in the Ukraine, of all things, hmm. uh, support for artists uh, in post-Soviet Ukraine. And I looked for this stuff, and so I found a few places, and I ended up buying over the years, maybe 30 to 40 pieces, originals, oils, watercolors. I don't buy, you know, um, seconds or prints or anything like that. Now, the, the thing about this is, don't misunderstand, I can't afford this stuff now. Hmm. But back then, you could hmm. for two things. They didn't really value that at that time. It was a Soviet culture. A lot of people were glad to see that those things go away. Hmm. Um, now, I think there's, they're going through a renaissance. People, you know, you know there's, I hear hmm. Russians say, well, it may be Soviet art, but it's our it's our oh, art, it's our yeah. history. Yeah. So, and then so what I did was um, I did this when I went to China. Although it's a bit different, people seem to lump social realism all together like it's all the same, and it's, mm. there are certainly a lot of similarities. But the Chinese story is different, and so therefore the, the history of the art is different. Mm. Um, so I collected and found. I stumbled on an artist up in Yan'an, where it's one of Mao's, where Mao was surviving in the Japanese bombing raids in 1941, 42, 43, at the end of the Long March. You know, people were creating woodblock prints and some watercolors and things, and then there's a strong tradition there. So I ended up collecting there. And then when I went to Afghanistan, when I had all those six weeks, I couldn't get across the border in Uzbekistan. So I just combed through the galleries in Tashkent and uh, stumbled on a few pieces. And, and picked up another, I think, 18 pieces in Tashkent in 2000, 2001, mm. October 2001. Shipped them all out before I crossed the border mm. um, and picked them up here. So we have um, a handful of collections. We have a Russian so social realist collection, a Chinese, what they call revolutionary romanticism. It's kind of the same thing. And then we have also a Vietnamese collection. Um, one of my favorite exhibits in the British Museum many years ago was a collection, an exhibit of Vietnamese artists' depiction of the war game. Against America, you know, the U.S. Mm. war, Vietnam war. And I thought it was fascinating. So I, the ones I liked the best, you know, I took these names down. And then the next time I was in China, I flew down to Hanoi and I found one of the artists and was able to get a bunch of the last pieces he had. Yeah. And so I only have like, I think, 15 pieces or 16 mm. pieces of his. But mm. so, yeah, we have that. But so the reason behind red, red paint collection was red is kind of a socialist color. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was that. Actually, I owe that name to somebody here in the office, to Julius, who's next door. Yeah. Doing some editing or watching the show. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. Julius, is that you? I don't know. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> so, but, so, you know, we like it, and we made yeah. a couple shows about it. We did uh, uh, um, Masses to Masses, Artist in Mao's China, mm. about a pretty famous uh, Chinese artist, which we collect a lot of pieces. Mm. And, um, we, and then uh, we did Arts of the Mall. On soon, of course, about art in Africa. I don't think we received that job or got that job based on that. Cause I, but I think it was kind of funny we got it because somebody had just said, "Well, here's the guy who's been to Iraq and all these places." Mm. Could, and you know, I think they perceived more danger mm. in Zanzibar and Tanzania than I thought. Yeah, but they were looking looking for somebody who could do it. Which I mean, I, I'm flattered. And I was glad that we they picked us or they asked us if we'd do it. It was a great, it was a fun, really great project. Okay. Now, my final question, and then I'll let you go. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday evening over there. Um, at uh, five o'clock, we're going to put out the blog post for West Africa. And, and I've said here, West Africa, the new front line, because that kind of, sort of post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan, and the whole kind of, you know, Daesh, ISIS movement with uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, um, sort of, you know, Niger, Malawi, uh, Malawi and places like that. Now, you've just been to... Um, not Malawi, um, Mali. You've been to Mali, haven't you, making a documentary and stuff. What was your feeling while you were there? Did you get a sense of there was it was changing? Because you were saying there's a difference between the north and the south, isn't there? Well, yeah. The north, of course, large tracts are you know under military control. Um, there's massive amounts of refugees. You see the big refugee camps out by the, uh, the garbage dump in, in southern, the capital of Bamako in the southern part, out by the airport. Uh, we went and talked to some of those um, 
you know, people in those refugee camps. And so I can't say I have a lot of experience. I have not been to the north. I have been to Timbuktu or any of those places, Mokti. But I spent, uh, we've been every year for the last three years, 2017, 18, and 19, sort of looking at village life and the situation in um, in the south, in the area of Wellesabugu. And we're working closely with an NGO there, uh, the Wellesabugu Alliance, who just happens to be locally based here in Salt Lake. They've been operating in the region for 30 years. And that whole film came together because, gosh, in 2000, a crew was sent there from one of the, the university here in partnership, and their idea was to document village life. Mainly, it was, a, it was done by the Women's Studies Department. They were going to document women's life, life of women. But since the whole thing has sort of turned, and they, they, they handed me this footage to look at, and I started looking at it, and we, we approached the NGO, and I said, you know, it'd be really interesting to do a, a story about Molly. But like all documentary stories, in my experience, you have like a, an idea from inception, and it, it evolves. And so we were going to take the 2000 footage and sort of juxtapose it with the 2018 footage mm. and show. But we weren't able, and we had a list of all the key characters. We, a lot of them have passed away. Um, some of them we tried to interview. And you know how, and sometimes people are great storytellers and good on camera, and, and some weren't, you know. So we, we really struggled. But we did find an interesting family that had been through a lot and she was one who was originally filmed as a young bride in 2000 she was 13 years old or something wow. like that wow now she lives in a neighboring village and so we kind of went with that, that family because their their story was interesting because struggling farmer he gets sick and almost dies which would have caved the entire family he's got a brother and you know as a mechanic in the capital yet the son has gone to these sort of what they call these local gold mines which are just you know pits of despair it's just unbelievable nobody wants their kids to go to the gold mines but there's nobody nobody has any money so they go to these gold mines to try to make money to try to dig for gold and strike it rich or get enough to just i don't know just a little bit so it's kind of an interesting story and so what we thought about was and then these refugees are pouring in from the north so rather than do a war story in the north which we have done a lot in our past you know the war story we're looking at the impact just to the lives of villagers in the south. Like there's one village we went to that just accepted 100 refugees from the north. The village itself only has 300 or 400 people, so you're adding 20% yeah. of the village comes from a new area. If they, you know, there's, there's, there's a um, possibility of friction between this new group and the villagers. How do they make it work? What's life like for that? Is it fully embracing? Now they're different ethnic groups as well. Mm. So we're just kind of doing it. It's not really a hard-hitting... There's like, like no real sort of what I'm trying to say, climactic ending or point to the story. It's just kind of like a, I wouldn't say it's cinema verite, but you just kind of want to observe. It's so hmm. observational. And like here's a family, and it's, they live in different locations, but they go through this whole thing as a family unit. They're emblematic of other families. Here come these refugees. These are new families. Hmm. How do they interact? Hmm. Hmm. You know, it's probably a very narrow topic that's only going to hmm. interest you know, people interested in Molly. But I also feel like it's a story that's not being told. Well, nothing's really being told. I don't even see war documentaries coming out of the North right now. Mm. I mean, it's really, for the, for the European and you know, for the Westerner, it's a French story. Mm. You know, it's a former French colony. They're the largest commitment of troops in the area. You know, they've been running a, a combat mission there, I think, I want to say since 2013. Could be a year or two off. Mm. So, mm. you know, but it's, an inter- we, it's been a really fascinating story. Yeah, okay. That's great. Well, listen, thanks for uh, taking some time to talk to us. Could you do me a favour? It's a very poor connection, our end, so we couldn't quite make out that uh, image behind you. So could you take take a photograph of that and send it through to us? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the painting. Yeah, because we can put it in the blog post then, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. And I'll have to shine some light on it. Yeah. It's an overcast day, and I don't, and I don't, have, you know, I don't operate in a museum. We have a nice little office, but uh, <laughs> the light's not great on it. But we can do that for sure, John. Lovely. Thanks for talking to us, Dodge. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Good luck with the rest of the uh, 24-hour event. Thanks very much. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye, John. Bye.